This is Harriet Grayson, your host and producer for Community Culture Showcase. So it's almost fall, and it's already, as we've been hearing on the radio and the TV, hurricane season. It hasn't uh, approached here in New England yet, but be advised as we watch what's going on all over the country, and of course our prayers with, with everyone to make sure they uh, safely find themselves a place to ride out the storm. And I have with me today a very interesting guest, someone who has many, many hats on, and he's going to talk about all of them, and then we're going to hear about something very, very special going to happen later in September. So Jim Streeter, welcome to my show. So tell us, I know you as a historian, that's how I identify you, but you wear many, many, many hats. So talk about a little bit about yourself and all the things that you've become involved in. Well, I appreciate you having me on the show. And the, the question you asked is, can be convoluted in a way because there are numerous hats, but first of all, I want to say most of them are connected with community service, which I'm thoroughly involved in and, and thoroughly enjoy. Uh, I'm a native of Groton, or I consider myself a native. Okay. Uh, my family moved here when I was six months old. Oh, they, uh, you're a native. I grew up in Poquonic Bridge, went to the local schools, and then when I was a early in my early teens, we moved over to the borough of Groton. The only time I really spent away from home was the four years in the military. Okay. I was in the Army Security Agency. I came back and uh, went right on to the borough of Groton. Well, at the time, it was the city of Groton Police Department. Hmm. Uh, I spent nine years there. Okay. Uh, and then I went to uh, the electric boat company as an investigator in their security department. Hmm. And ultimately, 17 years later, I retired from there as the chief of investigations for General Dynamics. Uh, to which I traveled the country doing investigations for General Dynamics. And the reason why I mention that is subsequently I uh, became an evidence specialist with the Connecticut State Police Forensic Science Laboratory. Mm. I was hired as what they call a question document slash handwriting examiner. Uh, my expertise for that started when I was with General Dynamics because traveling the country Many of the cases that I was involved in were frauds and forgeries, oh, okay. to which you need to hire a court-qualified question document examiner. And we hired one from uh, Boston, Massachusetts, a lovely lady. She was 80 years old. Oh, my goodness. And, okay. Uh, There's hope out there for new occupations. <laughs> yes, there is. And after watching her conduct her examinations, I asked her, how, how do you become a, an examiner? Right. And she says, through apprenticeship. Oh. So I asked her if I could apprentice under her, and she did oh. accept that offer. Uh, I apprenticed under her for about six months. Usually it's a two-year period of time, and unfortunately she passed away. Oh, my, okay. However, she had provided me with the materials and the outlines and course of study uh, to follow, which I did uh, for the next about two years. Mm -hmm. uh, then. I was hired at the Connecticut State Police Forensic Lab and I finished up my apprenticeship uh, learning the equipment and, and other procedures. I also attended the uh, U.S. Secret Service Question Document Examination Schools, the Federal Bureau of Investigations Handwriting Schools, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I completed my apprenticeship and uh, as a result of that I uh, uh, worked for the Connecticut State Police Lab mm -hmm. for 15 years. Okay. Also, while at the lab, I uh, had an interest of watching other examinations, one of them being impressions examinations, footwear and tire tracks. Okay. Uh, and you have to re remember that a lot of the uh, activity at the laboratory involves crimes. Some of them are very major, mm -hmm. uh, homicides, and there are a lot of uh, footwear and tire mm -hmm. track impressions that are left at crime scenes. Wow. So I apprenticed there for two years also mm -hmm. and learned that trade. Uh, so I am a court qualified question document examiner, handwriting examiner, footwear examiner, oh and tire track examiner. Who would think that there would be so many divisions, but that's great. That's it is. Great. Uh, the fields in forensic science are, are varied and voluminous. Yes, uh, and, and seemingly very segmented so that you get a particular track on this and this and this. Absolutely. Yes. If, if, for example, uh, forensic nursing, forensic accounting, mm 
Mm -hmm. uh, actually, the word forensic means as it relates to the law. So uh, all the disciplines are, are applying that as it relates to the law. Uh, but now I have in Groton my own private business, and I travel throughout the country doing footwear, tire track examinations, as well as handwriting and document examinations. What, what makes someone good at that? Is there some kind of attributes maybe that you discovered in yourself that said, oh, I would be very good at this? I, I believe that that's part of it. Uh, you have to have the interest and the will to learn. Uh, it does take quite a bit. I mean, the empirical data that you have to study, uh, and you're constantly learning new techniques. Mm -hmm. uh, I just returned from uh, uh, Texas, San Antonio, Texas, uh, where I attended numerous classes and updates on footwear impression evidence. Mm. Uh, last year, I went to several schools held by the FBI relating to handwriting and question document schools. So you're constantly learning, and you have to. You have to keep up to date with it. Uh, I, would, I would suspect that because of technology that much of this has changed, perhaps, gotten finer, more distinct. Um, made it easier for, I would assume some of this goes to juries and trials where the evidence is presented and it becomes clear to the jury that in fact someone is the culprit because of this yes. evidence that you're presenting. How has that changed in terms of technology? I'm glad you brought that up because in today's world, and I know I, I probably testify at least 10 to 20 times a year in various trials, uh, jury trials as well as trials by judge, mm -hmm. uh, they, they seem to expect I need to see forensic evidence. I want to see the forensics. Uh, so the technology, you're absolutely correct, has been employed into our disciplines. Uh, Probably uh, 50 years ago, we did not have the equipment that we use today, mm -hmm. it, even in handwriting and documents. Uh, one of the examples, uh, we have a device called a video spectral comparator, okay. VSC. Sure. Uh, and that's a picture of you working with this piece of equipment. That's correct. And of course, working at the laboratory, the, the equipment was made available and purchased by the state. Mm -hmm. uh, that particular piece of equipment is valued at about $150,000. Right, right. Now, when I retired, I still needed that piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, so a, a friend of mine who is also a document examiner, uh, we purchased a used one for $23,000. So we thought we were very fortunate. Right. What that piece of equipment does, it distinguishes between the pigments of inks uh, using ultraviolet and infrared filtering systems. To the naked eye, a black ink is a black ink. Mm -hmm. But if you were to take several inks and put them underneath this uh, spectral comparator, right. the machine actually will show you the differences. Uh, where that comes into play is you have a forgery where they insert some writing or insert some numbers at a later time. Mm -hmm. And if they do not use the same writing instrument, then that video spectral comparator that. will select that. Mm -hmm. It will also enhance documents. If it's very difficult to read, it's faded. Mm -hmm. It will enhance it. And uh, through the filtering systems, will e the ink will either reflect or absorb. So it'll be white or black, and mm -hmm. it'll show up. So that's, that's just an example of some of the equipment. Sure, sure. Now, I was mentioning before we came on camera that my daughter is a pathologist, so she's always interested and does her life is spent looking oftentimes in a microscope yes. for all kinds of traces of disease and, of course, cause of death so that I can understand, and, and their microscopes are enormously expensive. So, yes, and the technology keeps on changing and refining itself. The equipment gets better, gets finer in terms of things that you can see. I'm sure that must be very similar to the experiences you The have. use of microscopes in the document area is commonplace. I have several microscopes that I use, and you're bringing things up to at least 100 times. And the purpose of that is to, say if you're using a ballpoint pen, mm -hmm. the ball itself will have defects on it, and you'll see striations in the ink impression, 
and it will tell you whether that, that particular instrument was used to write this particular document. It will also, uh, in forgery, if you're copying something, you will hesitate for a second. Well, if you stop for a nanosecond, mm -hmm. the pen is still depositing ink. Right. And through, the, through magnification, you can actually see the large deposit of ink where the hesitation took place. And that's one of the elements of forgery. Mm. Uh, another one uh, is what we call feathering. When you sign your signature, either going in or finishing off, the line will narrow. So it'll go to a point, so that's what we call feathering. Mm. Uh, under a microscope, you can pick that out. Uh, if you have photocopies, you can't see that because photocopying often masks mm. those feathering moments. So, yep, microscopes are, are, are very, very, very helpful to us. Do you have a favorite case or a couple of favorite cases you want to share? I always have some cases that... Uh, to me, re rewarding. I also have some that are very frustrating. Mm -hmm. And not to get into, uh, uh, we'll say, gory cases. We had a young child that was uh, killed with a, a heavy instrument on her head, mm -hmm. and it left an impression. And uh, that was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. To this day, mm -hmm. when I go to a hardware store, or something like this, I'm looking for an instrument that has that particular pattern on it. Right. So you have cases like that. Uh, did you, did you, did they find the culprit? Uh, no, they have oh, not. They have not identified the, the instrument. And so that would be something that I'll carry on and hopefully yes. someday I'll, I will find that. Uh, I have been involved in a few high profile cases. Uh, the John Bonet Ramsey case. Oh, okay. I examined the uh, the handwriting in that particular case, and we won't discuss that. But mm -hmm. uh, that was there. I was also recently, in the last couple of years, involved in the Aaron Hernandez case up okay. in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, I did the footwear examination and the tire track examinations in that particular case. That was the um, football player. That was the uh, NFL football player from the Patriots. Yes. Right. Uh, those cases, they stick in your mind, mm -hmm. uh, but then I can give you other cases where uh, the, the figures, the, the dollar value mm -hmm. is just astronomical, something that I couldn't even, even imagine. Uh, where this was just last year, uh, there were five documents, five loans, mezzanine loans they call them, uh, anywhere from $1 million to $20 million in value. And there were four signatures on each one of the documents, and three of the signatures on all of the documents were forged. Oh, wow. Right. So those, you know. The, oh, yes, of course. Of course. Invaluable. Yeah. Invaluable. Do you think that things like CSI on TV has, in, has had increased interest by, say, people, younger people that want to do this as a, as a profession, that they see this stuff on TV? They say, yeah, that looks pretty interesting. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you see that every day. Uh, when I went to work at the laboratory, Dr. Henry Lee. Oh, yes. I remember that uh, name. He's the one that called me. He said, mm -hmm. Jimmy, I need you to come to work at the laboratory. We just had a document examiner left. So I did. And I worked with him. Well, a lot of the younger people look up to people like Dr. Lee. Mm -hmm. And they watch the television programs. And they, naturally, it's, it's so interesting right. uh, that they want to go into that field. Mm -hmm. Now, I teach at the University of New Haven as well as other colleges, but the University of New Haven in the graduate and undergraduate programs. Right. And if you can, each year, mm -hmm. there's three to 400 students in the undergraduate classes and upward to 100 students in the graduate cl classes. Wow. And they all want to become forensic examiners. Uh, the only problem mm -hmm. is the availability of positions. Right, right. So I always kind of advise them if, they, if they're really interested is to seek a double major. Go into chemistry. Uh -huh. Go into criminal justice. Right. Then when they, when they graduate, if there's there's no positions available in the forensic field mm -hmm. to go into the criminal justice and, and learn and maybe get their foot in the door there and then graduate into the forensic field. But mm -hmm. you're absolutely correct. Uh, CSI on television right. has, has garnered an interest in that field that's uh, astronomical. 
Would it also, would you venture to say that because of the uh, large number of those kinds of shows, there's an expectation on the part of people who serve on juries that they expect to see this kind of stuff, they certainly a rich state like Connecticut or Rhode Island or Massachusetts would certainly have enough money to provide all the kinds of equipment that you would need, that, that we have this expectation. Absolutely. I mentioned that earlier. Uh, and I can picture being, uh, being ready for the court, for the trial. And the jury would be sitting there and just kind of relaxed. And then when they hear, uh, my next witness is uh, James Streeter, a forensic document examiner. And they all sit up in their seat, mm -hmm. and now they're very attentive. And I use that as a, as a, a, a value, uh, Connor. Mm -hmm. If I see those juries, jurors looking at me and they're wide-eyed, I know they're attentive. And that's what they want to hear. Mm -hmm. Th they believe that the forensic evidence uh, speaks much, much better than testimony itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so it does. Uh, yeah, well, evidence. witnesses forget things. They, um, all kinds of things happen. They didn't really see, they didn't really hear, but something more scientific yes. might be new, neutral in terms of, of value. Uh, there would be no value in the same way that a witness might think they should say this or they would lie. Yep. Presumably the forensics doesn't lie. Absolutely. And uh, in today's world, with, as we discussed earlier, with all the disciplines, it's not unusual to have a case where you're having five, six, eight different disciplines testifying. Mm -hmm. So the jury is looking at, that's their help. Right. Help us. Because, um, and you hit it right. People uh, won't, won't tell you the truth all the time. Or you'll have a he said, she said. Mm -hmm. So there's conflicting testimony. Right. So oftentimes that forensic evidence, uh, as Dr. Lee would say, sometimes tells you the truth. Right, okay. right. And your stuff is mostly for the courts. Do you do anything else where, uh, just for, for other kinds of people who might want to document authorized or verified? Or oh, sure. Okay. Uh, my casework will involve criminal work mm -hmm. for prosecutors as well as defense attorneys. Mm -hmm. But I also work for other law firms uh, doing, like I mentioned, the, the case involving the, the mezzanine loans. Mm -hmm. I will do cases, and it's not infrequent to say, uh, look, I don't think the signature on my parents' will mm -hmm. is his or her signature. Oh, okay. So I'm looking at that. Right. Um, I, the variety of cases they come in, it's, it's, okay. it's interesting. Yes, yes, it is. definitely. Uh, but they're looking for you for the answer. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they don't like your answer. Right. Uh, sometimes you, you have to say, look, uh, that is your father's signature. Mm -hmm. You never, ever, ever sign your signature the same way twice. Mm -hmm. There's always some variation. But when you're signing an important document, such as a will, such as a, uh, a contract, mm -hmm. such as a mortgage, you take your time. It's, a, it's, a, it's an intended, or in, your signature's intent. Mm -hmm. uh, you're very neat and, and, and very serious about it. It's a formal signature. Right. But if you're signing a, a, a check, it's, yeah, scribble, scribble. Let, me get, let me get out of here. Right, right. Uh, and it's altogether different. Mm. That's where we're trained. Mm -hmm. We can look at certain things like that mm -hmm. and say, look, th there are variations. This is the natural variation of this person's signature. That's why the document examiner will say, provide me with 50 to 100 mm -hmm. signatures about the same period of time, contemporaneous as we call it, because your signature can change over time also, so, mm. uh, yeah. Did you also, as your interest in history, then mean that you have done some docu document looking uh, for historical purposes? I have looked at documents, older documents, and it's interesting, I'm a handwriting expert. Okay. However, I have great difficulty mm -hmm. in reading language from the 16 and 1700s, or <laughs> writing from the 16 or 1700s. Right. Uh, but I have looked at documents uh, for the authenticity as far as paper right. and ink is concerned. Yes. Uh, because there are a lot of uh, forgeries out there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, reproductions mm -hmm. and you have to be careful with that right uh, you can buy older paper you mm -hmm. can buy older ink mm -hmm. uh, but you have to be careful with mm -hmm. what you buy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would imagine things like auction houses 
might uh, need the services of someone like yourself to, uh, especially if it, when it comes to documents of one kind yes. or another, to verify or give some sense of uh, legitimacy to something they want to sell for probably a high price. I have been uh, I have been contacted numerous times by by uh, museums uh, to verify that the document is indeed legitimate. Mm -hmm. right. I've also been uh, contacted by by museums to look at signatures on art mm -hmm. to see if, if the artist's signature is compared and it's difficult because you they're not using a pen right they're right. using a brush right. they're using a different type of, of instrument but again you look at the natural variation mm -hmm. you gather as many known signatures on paintings of that individual and do the comparisons there do you also think that the uh, crooks have gotten more sophisticated, the same equipment that you use to uh, find them out is the same equipment that they might use to produce frauds? Well, I won't say equipment, but they, they're always constantly, well, let me, let's see if we can beat the system. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Uh, we had a, a homicide, a, a young man working at a local supermarket, although he was 25, fell in love with a 50-year-old female that was working there mm -hmm. and uh, he developed these elaborate plans mm -hmm. to kidnap her and kill her husband oh okay uh, he wrote all of his, his his plans down on pieces of paper and put them in a, a, a cigarette tray in his car <laughs> one of the items he put on there was wear boots four sizes larger and wear socks underneath to kind of throw off oh your foot size yes. so there's always you know they'll they'll clean things uh, mm -hmm. uh i've had footwear cases where they use bleach mm -hmm. well unfortunately bleach bleach will clean off some of it mm -hmm. but it's those cracks and crevices right. that we go into and take the samples for the dna mm. uh, the impressions themselves of the crime scene. You can t take the blood off your boots, but you can't take away the individual characteristics on the outsole of your shoes or boots mm -hmm. that are left at the crime scene. They'll be a present on your, your boots. So, uh, Fascinating. They try to do that. Fascinating. Sure. So now you have a new event coming up. Do you want to share with us the uh, your event that's coming up with Avery Coop House, which is right here in Brighton? Absolutely. The, uh, I'm on the board of the... Uh, trustees for the Avery Cop House oh. Museum. Okay. And uh, we're always looking ways to, to uh, raise raise funds. So okay. I happened to be talking about the forensic field and they said, geez, that would, might be an interesting fundraiser. So September 27th. Okay, and we have a, we have a uh, nice flyer that talks about that as well uh, for this event. Okay. All right. September? So, September 27th. Right. What? Oh, here it is. September at 27th. At 7 o'clock. 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Yep. At the Italian Club the on Ita Mitchell Street. Okay. Uh, we'll be having a wine, dessert, and a CSI program. Oh, uh, okay. Now, the tickets for that, don't call the Italian Club. That's All where right. we're holding it. Right. Uh, they can be obtained by calling the Avery uh, Cop House Museum. Okay. And the number should be on the on the board there. Okay, 860-445-1637. And also, can you go online uh, on the website? And you can order tickets uh, directly on the website? I d I'm not sure on that. Uh, yeah, I get it. No, yes, no, no. <laughs> uh, that's what I thought. <laughs> I believe you have, to, you have to call them. You have to call them, uh, okay. And the purpose for that is they, they want to know how many desserts to make. Of course, right? of course, uh, of course. I've presented this program before at other venues, mm -hmm. and uh, it's been well accepted. Mm -hmm. As we discussed, CSI today is, right. is a popular subject. And we try to make it uh, entertaining. Mm -hmm. I will provide the the background of what I do, mm -hmm. how I do it, right. and throw in actual casework okay. so they get the flavor of it. Uh, it's not a gory program. I don't <laughs> want people to get upset with it. But it does have some adult matter in it. So we've, okay. we've asked that... 14 be, and up, is that yeah, the... Uh, that's is that, correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if, if you're under 14, I would suggest that you... You're not, I, I, you know, Stay at home. There are some adult things mm -hmm. uh, in the program, 
But it is an interesting, I, even to myself, I, I watch it and, and I talk a, uh, I talk a good program Okay. when it comes to, to that because I've lived it. Mm -hmm. I've experienced those. I, th I also think that you bring a natural enthusiasm to what you do. Lots of people do things and they're just doing it to get by. Uh, when I talk to you, I see, I feel the enthusiasm, the great belief, I think, that you said you deal with community service, that you are doing many things to sometimes save us from ourselves in terms of the investigations that you do to bring justice to people who might have lost someone or else even a financial institution to bring justice for things that may have been attempted to be stolen from them. So I can see that, I can feel that. I think that's very important. Thank you. Yes. The, the program also provides an educational um, aspect. Mm -hmm. which is, I didn't know we could do that. Uh, and people will think about that. Yes. Jeez, maybe, maybe I should contact this person. I have this particular case. I'm not looking for work. Believe right. Me. No. 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 Uh, I, I hear you. I uh, hear you. But that educational purpose, and they, they sure. sit there. It boils down. It's a real world. Mm-hmm. Uh, fortunately, you have individuals such as myself that'll take that aspect on, so you don't have to worry about it. It's like the police officer. Mm -hmm. If something goes wrong, the first thing you, you comes to your mind, I need help. Well, who comes? The police officer. Right. And takes that burden off of you. Uh, fortunately, uh, uh, it started when I was on the police. I was on the police city police department for about nine years. Mm -hmm. and they had what they called an omnibus crime bill where they wanted to professionalize police officers mm -hmm. and they sent them to school and they paid for their college educations okay a, a major portion of it mm -hmm. and that did it helped considerably right so the police officer now responded and I, I always show this slide where back in the 40s of two police officers pointing with their foot mm -hmm. to some blood spots on on the ground right that was their forensics back then right right now right. we rope off the area yes. we come in pristine gloves and, right. and we'll take a swab and we'll preserve that sure. and we send it to the laboratory right and which is science at its best yes and yes so so we're taking care of that aspect of right it. Yeah. so this particular program who do you think might be interested in attending what kind of what kind of people would be your audience I would say the people that watch the television program, the mm -hmm. CSI, said, geez, and we have a local person that does that? Okay. Or mm -hmm. the person that, geez, I don't know much about this. Mm -hmm. And I hate to say this, but I have some followers also. Oh, okay. They know about my activities in the historical uh, world of Groton. Okay. But they say, geez, uh, what, what, is his, what is his duties in the forensic field? I think they'll be there. I, I think we'll have a, a good, rounded uh, audience that, right. will, that will attend. Right. Now, we want to promote, promote this. I think it's a, number one and most importantly, is because it's an important museum here in our community that they all need help. And uh, your expertise in being a presenter is kind of a natural help for them to have a program with you as, uh, as the star. But I mean, we do at this program, this this station. We like to promote our local, uh, our local museums, historic houses, so that we get the population to come out and visit and uh, see what we have available here because we are a very historical area. Yes, this the program, the people that will attend mm -hmm. from the AV Cop House Museum will promote our museum also. Mm -hmm. uh, Hopefully they'll pick up the literature mm -hmm. uh, that's there and not only listen to the CSI, but look at this and say, boy, I didn't know we had this particular museum here. Right. I'd like to go visit it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we like. We want to garner an interest right. in the Avery Cop House Museum. It's, it's a wonderful place. It's an educational facility. Uh, what, what's, what, is in, what is housed in the museum that would be of interest, perhaps, to people who are completely unfamiliar with it? It, 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 it'll show you a caption of time. Mm -hmm. It shows a family that, that was a mainstay in Groton and the house and how they lived. Uh, it'll show how they had servants, how the servants uh, took care of things, how right. they lived. Uh, it'll show some of the uh, 
cooking procedures that took place. Sure. Uh, Leslie Evan is just a sweetheart as, mm -hmm. and no, so knowledgeable, and she's a, a curator. And there's two or three of, of her workers that, that come in and they role play. Oh, nice. And it just gives you a flavor mm -hmm. of what it was like to live like that. Uh, the museum also has a, uh, an archival uh, facility okay. uh, relating to the AV cops as well as other areas of Groton. And that's an invaluable resource for people that are, that are looking for Groton history. Yes, and uh, what's a, is it, it's a 19th century house, is that what it is? It is. Yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah. And of course we have, um, we have a lot of wonderful museums and historic houses in the Groton area. People don't associate Groton with the great history that in fact is part of it. I guess even you know even before the Revolutionary War. Yes. So yes, it's a good thing to to promote that kind of stuff. How did you get involved with the museum, for example? Well, my involvement with uh, local history. Okay. Uh, when I got out of the army, uh, I settled down a little bit and, mm -hmm. and started listening to some of the old timers talking when I went to, when I was on the police department. Mm -hmm. And I said, "Geez, I didn't realize that," and uh, it garnered my interest. Right. And I I went from there. And, uh, and then I, my mentor, okay. Carol Kimball, uh -huh. I, I worked with her and uh, it, we just hit it off together. And from that point on, I, I just absorbed everything in history on Groton into, into what I could mm -hmm. and then felt, look, let's pass this along. Right. Uh, the history doesn't belong to me. Mm -hmm. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to everybody. Exactly. Uh, so I had a major collection uh, by major, I'm estimating that it probably was in valued in, in excess of probably a quarter of a million dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, voluminous enough where I took up two walk-in closets in my house, an attic, mm. part of my forensic office, and then I started moving into my daughter's garage. <laughs> so. Uh, we made a conscious decision to donate that to the Groton Public Library. Oh. So it's accessible to everyone. Right, right. I started documenting, writing articles for local newspapers. Mm -hmm. And then along with Carol Kimball and Marilyn Comrie, uh, we decided we should document these into books. So... Uh, you are the author of several books. I am. Yes, and in fact, is um, we have one that we have a photo of, which is Remembering Our Veterans. Tell us a little bit about this book. Well, I got involved with, uh, I was sitting in church one day, the Congregational Church, mm -hmm. and I looked underneath a, a stained glass window and I saw a, a bronze plaque. Mm -hmm. And I turned to my wife and said, what is that plaque? She says, I don't know. So after the service, we went over and looked, and it was dedicated to the members of the church that fought in World War II. And I said, how many other memorial plaques are out there that no one is aware of, that they're so obscure, unless you belong to the church, you wouldn't know. Right. So four years later, I finished my research uh -huh. and found that Groton has well over 100 memorials to, within its confines, the between the Mystic River and the Thames River. Right, and so this book is remembering our veterans from the Groton area only. It is. It, uh, it documents all the veterans and war memorials between the Thames River mm -hmm. and the Connecticut River. Uh, a conscious decision on this particular book was to donate the proceeds for this book to the uh, Veterans uh, Committee at the Groton Elks Club, who okay. support the Rocky Hill veterans. Uh, the home? The home. Okay. Yep. All right. That's interesting. Uh, so already uh, I've donated a check for $1,000 to them. Mm -hmm. uh, from the proceeds of the book. Mm. And uh, it came out, unfortunately, after November last year. So we're going to really promote it this year for Veterans Day in November. Okay, that's a good thing. Yeah. My father was a veteran of World War II, okay. having served in North Africa and China, Burma, and India. Wow. So uh, in the Army Air Corps. Mm. So that was a da dangerous work. It was. Dangerous work. But uh, I say he... He thoroughly enjoyed it, didn't speak a lot about it, mm -hmm. but um, he definitely, when he died, he did get a, uh, a soldier's, uh, a soldier's bur a burial, uh, yes. the American flag on yep. his casket, which I keep in my home. That's nice. Yes, That's to, nice. Rem yes to remember, yep. and of course many people did not 
come home. Also so, in this book, uh, one of the memorials that we have is, is right outside the, between the Senior Center and the Groton Public Library. Oh, yeah. There's a Veterans Memorial Park there. And uh, there are several uh, panels, granite panels that are four foot by eight foot. Mm -hmm. uh, one for World War I, World War II, one for Korea and Vietnam, right? And now we just put one in for Afghanistan, mm -hmm. Persian Gulf. Mm -hmm. There's another panel out there that lists the 67 casualties from Groton. And uh, God rest his soul, a gentleman named William Hart, Bill Hart, was a Korean War veteran. He was instrumental in starting that park. Right. But he did the background on each one of those individuals. Mm. Uh, and uh, when they were born, when they died, how mm -hmm. they died. and. So I went to the, his family after he passed and said, mm -hmm. could we use that in the book? Because I think it's important that we do that. So they're in there. Oh, uh, okay. So they are, they are remembered well yeah. after. That's great. Uh, same with the submarine veterans. Uh, mm. We have a major submarine memorial for World War II mm -hmm. down near the Avery Cop House right. right, on Bird Street and Thames Street. And there's a wall there. And I went to them and they provided me permission to list everybody that's on that wall. So they're contained in the book. Uh, uh, it's an important thing to document this. Absolutely, uh, for future I, generations, absolutely, to yes. know what, how it was important to do sacrifice for your country when the, your country asked you. I think we, uh, we've lost a, quite a bit of that yet because our last wars that we have been fighting are completely with volunteers mm -hmm. and it's a, such a small percentage of the population that we don't have this sense of all of us sharing in the sacrifice I mean, and that that is missing and where people now it's my father served before I was born and the people talked about the sacrifices they made even civilians rationing things during World War II uh, some sense of that in Korea because it followed World War II so closely, but the rest sort of um, just, fading or yes. just like a blip. Although many people um, who are my generation were, if they were men, they were actually drafted in, into Vietnam. But that was the last time I think that we actually had um, conscription and now it's completely volunteer and this whole sense of military sacrifice. Absolutely. Absolutely lost on, on young people, unless they happen to know someone who's, who has been serving in the military. And most people absolutely do not know that. And that's the idea of the book. Yes, is to, definitely. To keep, keep the memory of our servicemen, mm -hmm. service women, and their activities and their sacrifices continuing. Right. So people don't forget what they sacrificed for us. Mm -hmm. uh, but the book does, it brings out some interesting points also uh, of the obscurity. Uh, if you go down on Thames Street, uh, there's a, the city of Groton has a filtration plant, and there's a small uh, parklet down there where the, the Heritage Park boat goes back and forth to New London. Okay. okay? There's a round a millstone down there, and people don't realize it. It's dedicated to the, to the prisoners of war that were taken during the Battle of Fort Griswold. Oh my. So there's yeah. another obscure monument mm -hmm. that at least we were pointed out so people will know, geez, I never realized that. Right, exactly. When you um, went to interview people for this book, what did you say to families? Like when you got the list, you went and actually physically went in that and interviewed the family? No, the list, no. Uh, Bill Hart had already had already done uh, the list of, or compiled the list. Uh, this was mostly interviewing people about a specific monument. And then they say, oh, by the way, did you know there's another one here? I, said, I didn't realize that. Okay. So it was just the four years of, of, of collecting them all, photographing them all, documenting when they were established mm -hmm. right, and how they were established. Uh, that's what went into that particular book. How do you do that? You know, I, I, I suspect because of your great interest in documents, just in general. How do you actually do what you just described? How, how do you find out information about something like a, you look at something and see this memorial and say, well, how do you start? I mean, I think people are interested in how you have to think about what it is that you need to do to get it going. Well, naturally the newspapers are, are a tremendous resource. Okay. But you have to start someplace. You have mm -hmm. to say, 
approximately when was this established? So the person you're interviewing say, oh yeah, that flagpole uh, that was put up right after World War II. So I said, okay, let's go back to 1940, whatever, and, and start with the newspapers. Uh, internet today, mm -hmm. plug it in. Oh, Hopefully okay. it's there. I know uh, on the submarine base, there are probably 40, no, probably around 30 or 35 memorials on the submarine base that people, the average person, will not be able to see because right. of the restrictions of going on sure, the base. Sure, sure. The Nautilus Museum was a tremendous asset there. Uh, there's a woman up there, Wendy Gully, and she just dropped everything and went up there and she pulled all the files and all, there's several buildings that were named after people, there's baseball fields. Mm. She just dropped everything and, and when I came in and asked, what they were going to name a baseball field after Yogi Berra, the, <laughs> the uh, Yankee player, and uh, unfortunately he's passed, but uh, when I mentioned that, she said, but there were two other baseball fields that were named for other people. So she acquired the names and the files, and now they're in the book, and as well as the photographs. So there are a lot of resources out there. If you, if, you know, you have to use your your thought process and say, where would that be, and then go from there. I think part of what you're describing is this sense of being able to investigate. I'm not sure that everyone out here can have those kinds of attributes, even think that way. So that I would imagine that someone who was an investigative policeman, for example, or even the fire, because they're always investigating arson, that that is a certain kind of mindset that isn't like everybody else, that there's a certain way that you would think that leads you from point A to point B. And not everybody goes from point A to point B. They might skip ahead to Z and then kind of miss the rest in between. So I think that, that, that you possess a certain kind of mindset that makes you really good at what you do and not, not everybody can do what you do. You know, as people might watch TV and think, oh, I can do that, but I know that that's not true. I, I, and I guess you're right, and I, I often say I'm blessed to be able to have the ability mm -hmm. and the desire to do that, and uh, so I apply it. Mm -hmm. But once you apply it, pass it along to everybody else. Get that information to other people. Mm -hmm. The books, this one included, they're more modern history. Mm -hmm. They go from the 1880s up to the 1970s. Uh, so it's more modern history, sure. but a hundred years from now, that's going to be hard historical information. Sure. And fortunately, we've documented it. Mm -hmm. uh, I tell nightmare stories on my personal computer at home. Of course, I have it backed up around the world. <laughs> I have over 22,000 historic photographs of Groton. Just wow. Groton. Wow. Uh, I would have had a lot more. Uh-huh. When I was on the police department, yes, we used a big, big camera had big bellows on it, and we had large film, large format film. Right. There were four of us that were trained to develop the film, and produce the pictures, print the pictures. Mm -hmm. well, while working on this, I would go back and look at the old photographs from the 1930s and the 1940s. Don't look at the accident. Look at the buildings in the background because they're all gone. Mm. Right? So after I left the police department, I went back and I said, do you think I could borrow some of those photographs? No, we threw them all away. Oh my, yes. So actually history was thrown away. Mm -hmm. And that's not a story on itself because it's, it's commonplace. Sure. There will be things in a family with photographs and, mm -hmm. and unfortunately there's no interest and they throw it away. Yes, I and, know exactly what you're talking about. And I usually about. have a trickle of tears yes, coming down yes, my face yes, when I hear yes. that. Yes, yes, No, they're, they are value, and of course, some technology allows you to save that stuff. So your computer is one way people actually go ahead and, and compile them and get uh, uh, flash drives and stuff with that contain a whole bunch of photographs. I mean, techn if you're interested, technology yes. does make it possible yes. to, for at least for people, to, to save this stuff of their own families. 
And I think about that because I was mentioning my father was in World War II. He had given, he had co collected some unbelievable photographs of um, British India, which then comprised of what is today Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan. And uh, Hindu and Muslim people and, and unbelievably fascinating stuff. And I think, because now I know that there's a way to save that for posterity, not even about my father per se, but just about these foreign places that have changed absolutely dramatically. And, and you're, you're right. And what happens if Eric Grayson were to come to me and said, I have all these pictures of Groton, I would say, could I borrow those? Mm -hmm. And I would set up a file on my computer for Harriet Grayson or the Grayson family. I would scan every one of your photographs into this file. So if I were to use them in the future, your family's name or your name would receive credit for it. But I would also provide you with, with a, a thumb drive mm -hmm. so you now have a copy of that. This file is within five minutes of my scanning these. Mm -hmm. It's saved around the world. So if my computer crashes, somebody if it burns it. or somebody steals mm -hmm. it, I call this telephone number and they send me everything that was on that. So it's saved forever. I mentioned earlier about providing my collection to the, to the library. Mm -hmm. The last thing that they will receive will be all of those photographs mm -hmm. to which they will put onto their web page. So everyone will have access right. to them. Right, right, to preserve that stuff. So you've gotten some, uh, obviously some, some commitments and assistance from, from the Groton Library that they will be the recipients of your huge amounts of information. They have received approximately two thirds of it. Oh, okay. And my lovely wife is anxious for me to Get relinquish the rest of it. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, but yes, and, and they have been uh, just wonderful with this collection. Mm -hmm. And one of the purposes for doing that, they, and I, I'm very humble about this, they increased the size of their history room, uh, doubled, almost tripled it, mm -hmm. and then named it in my honor. Oh, that's very sweet. Uh, but they have the facilities and the resources mm -hmm. to maintain these. I, I didn't have the archival materials I didn't have the uh, the catalog and uh, abilities or right. time to catalog it, uh, or the facilities to store it properly. They do, mm -hmm. and that's what they're doing. They have people that are just dedicated that are going through the material that I've been providing. Mm -hmm. They are cataloging it and then putting it into proper storage facilities, and it'll be there again for everybody to share. Mm -hmm. so. See, one of the things I think that has happened, like I, I have, I was just mentioning this collection of photographs from the 1940s from my father. None of my children are interested. I mean, they knew my father, um, and they used to kiss him and say, hello, Grandpa. But they, they do not have, none of them have any interest in, um, in, in having, in keeping these yes. or preserving these photographs. Mm -hmm. And as I said, it's, as you were mentioning, it's less about my father per se than it is a time in, in world history that is completely forgotten. I mean, maybe people in India, of course, know about it, but certainly people in the United States have no idea what uh, British India actually looked like. They, they might go see a movie or something, but this is real people, uh, real, and then of course, real American and British soldiers Mm -hmm. who were there at that period of time riding horses, riding, riding camels, riding elephants, yeah. because that's part of, and then, the, then just the aircraft that he was uh, involved with, all lost. So that it's, it is a shame. I think there isn't that appreciation. And I think you're fortunate that you found people at, at the Groton Library. So, you know, you know great, great stuff for them, yeah. seeing the treasure that you have and embracing it. And then on the other end of that spectrum is the fact that how I acquired them, right? Through eBay, through oh. flea markets, oh. through garages, garage sales, where they're, People they're trying to relinquish them, them they're trying yes. to sell them, get rid of them. Right, right, well, right. Those are treasure troves to me. Yes. I'll take that. I'll, yes. I'll buy that. Right? And fortunately, I have been fortunate enough mm -hmm. to be able to do that. And like I said, 
I'll give you an example of the walk-in closets. Mm -hmm. 22 file cabinets stacked up. Wow. On top of that, photographs. On top of that, blueprints and drawings. In front of those, large bins that were stacked to taller than I was. Mm. That's one. And you can imagine, it's just paper on top of paper. It's not like taking a magazine collection and putting it in a bin. It's just different pieces of paper. And well, it's great that the uh, library has the capacity and the willingness and the desire to then categorize all this stuff. Otherwise, it becomes, even for someone, even for an institution, just too much to handle. Yes. But they can then distribute it and, and put it into different places so that people come into the uh, library and they want to know about 1930s in Groton. There's, there it there's, is. there's, there's there a it story is. and there's information. And Betty Ann Ryder, the director at the library, mm -hmm. and Michael Spellman, he's the historian there, they, they, they recognize open them, arms. Yes, yes, they recognize yes, the treasure. We, we, we did sign an agreement that mm -hmm. I relinquished it, and when you, uh, it's like making a, uh, uh, turning a book over to a museum. Right. You relinquish control of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had no problem with that. That's great. None whatsoever. That's great. And, uh, of course, my wife would never hear this, but <laughs> I'm still collecting. <laughs> uh, I still go out, and uh, a gentleman came into a, a facility I was at, the store I was at today, and uh, mentioned that he had some uh, some older advertisements from Groton. And I said, yes. bring them down. Right. We'll take right. a look at them. Because you're, I the don't want them. you're the first dep depository <laughs> of all things Groton. <laughs> Just about. Yes. yes. I would imagine that there are many, uh, particularly men who served in, uh, in the military at the substation, uh, that would love to have some knowledge about what you've what you've collected, just because it it's over the years. The sub base has been there for a long time. Yes, we're talking about men, probably serving, um, you know, from what 1930s mm -hmm. on to the present day. Sure. I think that that is a kind of a fast. I don't know how you get in touch with these kinds of people, but that's a fascinating group that probably would like to see. What the just to show their own children and grandchildren what the neighborhood used to look like, and you through the library now has the ability to give them an opportunity to see that. I, I would I would imagine there are tens of thousands of pre predominantly men who would be interested in seeing what they're to show people what their what life was like in Groton beside the military duty, which I'm sure they're not allowed to talk about. And it, it does, it very frankly, I, I, I will be contacted by sailors mm -hmm. from the Navy as well. as We had a Coast Guard training station in Groton for quite a few years, from okay. 1938 to 1967. Thousands of Coast Guard sailors went to schools there, mm. and they lived in the local area just as the sailors from the submarine base did. And we did have military projects here, uh, like I grew up in Pequannock. Mm -hmm. That was built for... Uh, because of the military buildup. Right. Uh, Bill Avenue, over where Pfizer's is, now it's gone now, but mm. that was the Branford Ave Avenue apartment complex. They were all built for the buildup of the military. Right. Uh, and it, we joke uh, very frequently about President Jimmy Carter mm -hmm. lived on Bill Avenue when he was in the Navy, oh. at the station at the submarine base. Wow. And kids my age, a little bit older, uh, that grew up in that area, uh, remember Jimmy Carter living there. Interesting. Because he wasn't the president, so they didn't, right, they right. didn't go over and ask for his autograph. Right. But he, <laughs> well, he was up there in the ranks. Uh, yes. Yes, yep. he was up there in the ranks. And then I just learned, uh, well, uh, God rest his soul, uh, John McCain, Senator mm -hmm. McCain. I never realized, I knew his father was an admiral, mm -hmm. and didn't even click with me that he was stationed at the submarine base, and he lived in New London. I had no idea at all about That's, that. Yes, wonderful. So those fa families like that would come back and say, hey, where did we live when I grew up? Mm -hmm. There you go. Yes. There you go. So, Bill, I want to thank you for being on my program. I want you to give a, a shout out to, to the museum and, again, tell us one more time yep. about the upcoming event. We want everybody to come on and meet you as a fascinating person and also the museum as a fascinating place for us to remember our history. Can we get that flyer up again just to remind people? Upcoming September, there it is, September 27th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. And it is going to be at the Italian American Citizens Club. Is that what the name That's of it is? It. In, in on Mitchell Street in Groton. 
But again, don't buy your tickets from them. No, nope, you call the AV Cop House Museum. Absolutely. You call them and they'll they'll sell you a ticket in a heartbeat and the money will go to a good cause. Absolutely. So I want to thank Jim for being here. So let me tell you about a couple of things that are happening with Harriet Grayson, who is the organizer of literary salons. I want to invite people to come and enjoy local poets and writers. In fact, I'm going to ask Mr. Streeter if he wants to join me at one of my events and uh, share his knowledge with us. We look forward to having people come. The first upcoming one now is the fourth Tuesday of the month at the Malted Barley in downtown Westerly. I have been very fortunate. Fourth Tuesday, which in this month is September, I believe it's the 25th. Look it up, fourth Tuesday. Uh, come to the Malted Barley. I have been very happy with uh, Colin Bennett, who is the owner, has allowed us to use this beautiful venue upstairs. If you are a writer, if you are a poet, if you are a writer of fiction or nonfiction, an essayist, maybe even a journalist, and you would like to read things, please contact me. Grace and Harriet at gmail.com. We're always looking for people to participate, and we're, of course, always looking for an audience. We are very blessed in this area to have a tremendous amount of artists, and we want them to have an opportunity to read and to discuss their books. Then, on the first Wednesday of the month, the first Wednesday of the month at the Tapped Apple, another wonderful local venue in Westerly, Rhode Island, that is going to host us for Poets' Corner. And then at the third Wednesday, also at the Tapped Apple, we're going to have more authors of all kinds of uh, varieties. So please, come on out, support local writers, come on to our literary salons. If you have any questions, please contact me, graceandharriet at gmail.com, or you can always just call the station. We're always looking for new poets, new writers, an opportunity. We think in October, we're actually going to present a play by one of our local playwrights at the Malted Barley. So again, we're always looking for people to come and uh, do, do get in touch with me if you do know some kind, uh, some kind of writer. We're always looking for poets. Uh, you don't have to be published. You can just come and, and read your stuff. I just need to know in advance who's coming. And these are wonderful venues. The Malted Barley is as a, a beautiful place in downtown Westerly. Upstairs is our private room where we put on our presentations. The Tapped Apple is this wonderful venue in downtown Westerly. They're literally across the street from one another and they do uh, cider and apple wine. So if you have those hangovers from the grape wine, you might want to try the apple wine. So again, I invite you to participate and be with us, and I want to thank my guests for being here today. And again, this is Harriet Grayson, your host and producer for Community Culture Showcase. We hope to see you again soon.